So today we'll deal with understanding celiac disease so that we can make better laboratory diagnosis. Celiac disease is also known as celiac sprue, non-tropical sprue of gluten sensitive enteropathy. It's a common immune mediated inflammatory disease of the small intestine caused by sensitivity to dietary gluten and related proteins in genetically predisposed individuals. It differs from food allergies. Gluten-free diet for life will lead to complete resolution of symptoms and mucosal healing. So this condition is completely reversible provided we can make the right diagnosis. It was first described as celiac disease by Samuel Gee in 1888. Though when you look at the literature, you find that Eritreus from Cappadocia, now in Turkey, described similar malabsorption disorder in the second century AD. And the association of celiac disease with bread was established during the Second World War when William Deci recognized association of between consumption of bread and relapsing diarrhea. During the Second World War, since bread was not available, people shifted to non-conventional, non-cereal food like fruits, potatoes, bananas, milk or meat, and celiac disease disappeared. After the Second World War, once bread was available and started being consumed, the symptoms reappeared. So overall, gluten is the trigger in genetically predisposed persons along with certain risk factors over which we still have not got complete handle, but gluten in genetically predisposed condition persons will lead to celiac disease. And our aim is to understand the pathogenesis so that we can make rational choice of the test to be used. The area of involvement is the duodenum and the proximal duodenum. These two areas are involved in absorption of nutrition. Gluten, as I said, is the trigger and it is present in three of these foods. One is wheat, the other is barley, and the third is rye. Wheat consists of starch, protein, and lipids besides moisture. In proteins, you have albumins and globulins, but along with that, you have gluten. And then gluten is made out of, it can be divided into glutin and, uh, and glutenin and glutenin. Gluten is a major storage protein found in wheat, barley and rye, and imparts properties to flour which make it ideal for bread making. Gluten is made out of glutenin, represented here by long filaments, and glidin, represented by curved shaped violet structure. Glidin endows viscosity or thick and sticky property to the flour dough, whereas glutenin 
are mostly responsible for elasticity and cohesive strength of dough. Glidin is the bad guy. It triggers the immune response in genetically sensitive individuals. It's a polypeptide of 33 amino acids in length, which is a fraction of the gluten molecule and is particularly important in the pathogenesis of celiac disease. Glidin is resistant to degradation by gastrin pepsin and proteases in the small intestine. It's only when it is absorbed, then the terminal amino region is removed and then it becomes b amidated glidin peptide, which is more immunogenic than glidin itself. So among the food that is available, which are the three food elements which contain gluten? If you chose wheat, barley, and rye, you're right. Damage to the intestine is caused by the activated T lymphocytes. And I'll explain how the process takes place. But overall, it is an immune-mediated damage, which is triggered by glycogen. <coughs> As I said earlier, glycogen is a portion of gluten, which is particularly difficult to digest. Glycogen exposure induces the release of zonulin, a protein that modulates the permeability of tight junctions between enterocyte lining of the digestive tract. Zonulin appears to work by engaging chemo chemokine receptor CXCR3, which is overexpressed in patients with celiac disease predisposition. Zonulin binds to CXCR3 and it triggers a second messenger system that results in de-engagement of protein zona occludens from the tight junctions of a tight junction complex. This allows gliding to enter into the lamina propria. Glidin also induces enterocytes in the small intestine to release IL-15. IL-15 triggers the proliferation of intraepithelial intraepithelial lymphocytes abbreviated here as IEL, when these intraepithelial lymphocytes become activated, they begin to express NKG2D receptors. The ligand for NKG2D receptors is MYC-A, which is expressed on the surface of enterocytes. MYC-A exp is expressed by enterocytes under conditions of stress. NKG2D MYC-A engagement will trigger ILE to kill enterocytes by releasing enzymes to bring about cell lysis. Once the glidin gains access to lamina propria, it is deamidated by tissue transglutaminase enzyme, which is TTG. The deamidated process removes an amide group, leading to deamidated glidin, which is more immunogenic and more harmful. This glidin, deamidated glidin, is then presented by 
antigen presenting cells which express HLA DQ2 or DQ8 to CD4 positive helper T cells. Helper T cells will produce cytokines, which will then lead to more damage to the enterocytes. Cyto this helper T cells will also stimulate B cells, which will produce anti-TTG antibodies, anti-glidin antibodies, and anti-endomysial mesium antibodies, which we use for diagnosis. The pathology of celiac disease can be appreciated on histopathology. When you look at normal crypts, you find that the small intestine has long villous projections and they have small crypts. When celiac disease, uh, as a consequence of celiac disease, there is blunting of the villus, uh, of, of the normal villus, and they sometimes disappear. There is proliferation of intraepithelial lymphocytes, and there is crypt elongation. So these three changes occur in celiac disease. This was used by Marsh to classify the changes into type one change, type, type two, type three A, B, and C, indicating how seriously the villus has been damaged and how much, uh, what is the severity of the disease. To understand the role of HLA in celiac disease, as I indicated that the antigen presenting cells will present the glidin to lymphocytes on HLA-2 or HLA-DQ8. So overall, if this is the general population, you would find that some of them would have HLA-D2 or D8, DQ2 or DQ8. And only those, among those who have DQ2 or DQ8, only in those will celiac disease occur. But there may be many more in which celiac disease has not occurred. That would mean that HLA DQ2 or DQ8 is essential, is necessary, but not essential for celiac disease to appear. The clinical features of celiac disease are consequent of inflammatory intestinal inflammation and atrophy. Common clinical symptoms will be abdominal pain, diarrhea and vomiting, failure to thrive, especially in children, and malnutrition. These are all non-specific. There may also be conditions of comorbidities because there is immunological abnormalities and selective IgA deficiency is very common in celiac disease. There is also close association with type two diabetes mellitus and some dermatological disorders. In fact, the dermatological disorders are conspicuous by its presence. And one condition is known as dermatitis herpetiformis, which is also known as Derling's disease. This is chronic blistering skin condition. There is no virus involved, even though it is called herpetiformis. Autoantibodies are present and the person is gluten intolerant. It affects both male and females between the age of 15 to 40 years. There is intense itching, chronic papillovascular rash. And if you investigate by doing EMA test, then it will be positive by immunofluorescence. 
TTG will also be positive and the patient normally will be DL, uh, HLA, DQ2 and there will be improvement if gluten is withdrawn from the diet. So the clinical conditions, presentations can be classified into classical, which is diarrhea, gas, bloating, weight loss, or atypical, which is constipation, dyspepsia, anemia, osteoporosis, rash, neuropathy, hepatitis, dental enamel, hypoplasia, and infertility or silent. In many cases, the person has no symptoms and only positive antibodies are present. And if biopsy is done of the small intestine, then it is abnormal. Or it may be latent. No symptoms or signs are seen. Positive antibodies, normal biopsy, or celiac disease is in remission. So overall, you would find that there are no symptoms in 21% of cases. The typical symptoms of diarrhea, weight loss, and malabsorption are in 27% of cases. And in 52%, it's as a consequence of malabsorption. That would mean that celiac disease should be considered in the differential diagnosis and can present at any age to any specialty. As I indicated, classical symptoms could be because of iron deficiency anemia, could be weight loss, could be dermatitis herpetiformis, fatigue, bloating and gas, or non-classical symptoms will be LFT abnormalities, vitamin D deficiency, aphthous ulcers are quite common. Associated conditions are IgA deficiency, type A, diabetes mellitus, autoimmune thyroid disease, Down syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, vitiligo, IgA nephropathy, and, the and could be also complications and sarcomas and lymphomas are quite common in these kind of conditions. So how common is celiac disease? This question was asked by a professor in Harvard. He suggested that the projected number in cel of celiacs in US are 2 million or more than 2 million. But estimated numbers of known celiacs is 100,000 in a way hinting that more than 95% of celiac patients in the US are undiagnosed. He suggested that when he joined Harvard from, uh, from North, uh, when he joined from Ireland, at that time, the prevalence was 0.02%. One in four and a half thousand persons were supposed to be celiac. Recently, when they estimated, they found one in 100. The real person is 1%. And majority reason, main reason why celiac has been more commonly identified is the presence or is the availability of IgA TTG test. Since 2000, uh, since it's been available commercially, many persons have been testing it and it has good sensitivity and specificity as I'll explain later. This, uh, in a review, mostly by Indians from All India Institute, uh, they had indicated that the, <coughs> that the prevalence of celiac disease may be highest in Indians, somewhere about 1.8% rather than 1% in 
in Caucasians. Is the celiac disease more commonly is common or is it more commonly diagnosed now? An investigation was carried out once the once the anti-TTG uh, test was accepted as the right method to choose, and they looked at at twelve thousand odd persons where the sample was collected much earlier, and they found that. In 1950, uh, the diagnosis of, uh, of celiac disease because of positive TTG was entertained in 0.2%. But if the samples are tested now from those which are present in 2000, 0.9% of persons will be having positive TTG indicating they have celiac disease. So their conclusion was that celiac disease now is four times as common as it was 50 years back. So what would be the right diagnosis for, for uh, celiac disease? It could be presumptive diagnosis is based on positive serology. It's been suggested that confirmation must be made by intestinal biopsy and indicating villus atrophy. Definitive diagnosis can also be made by resolution of clinical symptoms after, after initia, initiation of gluten-free diet, which is generally accomplished by conversion to negative serology and reconstitution of villi. This is a completely reversible condition. Traditionally, as I said, the small ball has many villi and in celiac disease is characterized by atrophy of this villi. The first attempt to make the diagnosis of celiac disease was attempted in 1970, where a meeting of gastroenterologists in Interlikan suggested that three biopsies be used to demonstrate villous abnormalities, one with patient or normal gluten-containing diet, it disappears on introduction, it disappears on introduction of gluten-free diet, and it reoccurs on introduction of gluten in diet. That would confirm that this is because of gluten and a person is suffering from celiac disease. Before that, the diagnosis used to be made on clinical grounds. So this was the first time that a lab-based diagnosis of celiac disease, an objective diagnosis of celiac disease was defined in 1970. And Marsh had the classification looking at both, uh, looking at the villus, the intraepithelial lymphocytes, and the crypts. And this, this had, they had various types, 1, 2, 3A, 3B, 3C. So the milestone in diagnosis were, after this, then, in 1982, anti-glidin antibodies became available, but it had low sensitivity and specificity, leading to a large number of unnecessary biopsies being done. And so anti-glidin antibodies are no longer recommended to be tested. Subsequently, in 1985, they found that endomysial antibodies of IgA type using immunofluorescence, they could get good sensitivity and very high specificity because they're looking for autoantibodies. Subsequently, in 1997, it was noticed that endomysial antibodies cross-reacted with tissue transglutamase. So antibodies against uh, anti-tissue Anti-tissue transglutamase 
would also give you the same indication as endomysial antibodies. This TTG with the availability of recombinant TTG, ELISA was positive and it has become very common. In 2005, anti-deamided glidine peptide antibodies were available and this IgG was found to be more sensitive and specific than, uh, than IgG of TTG. You would note, I had already mentioned that celiac disease patients are prone to have IgA immunodeficiency. So you uh, sometimes anti-TTG may not work if you are looking for IgA because the patient is IgA immunodeficient. In that case, anti-DGP antibodies of IgG isotype would be preferred as a method. It was in 1990 then, 20 years after the first attempt, that instead of three biopsies, then they suggested that there could be only one biopsy at the beginning to demonstrate villus atrophy. And thereafter, uh, the, before that, the patient is screened by serological tests. So that slowly over the time, people have moved towards serology and given less importance to histopathology. The serological tests for celiac disease are anti-glidin antibodies. As I told you, both uh, anti-glidin antibodies were the first antibodies to be described. Both IgA and IgG isotypes were available in the LISA format, but it was found to have low sensitivity and specificity, and so it is no longer recommended. The serological test, which is recommended as the, as the best method, was described in 1985, in which they found that anti-endomysial antibodies, uh, usually detected by indirect immunofluorescence assay, initially using monkey esophagus as the tissue, and subsequently human umbilical cord as the substrate would give high correlation with histopathology. It had high sensitivity and specificity for celiac disease, but it has two drawbacks. One, that it requires the use of immunofluorescence microscope. The second is because uh, it needs the, uh, it needs, it's in the eye of the beholder, then there is amount of subjectivity in whether you see the fluorescence well or it is low fluorescence. But there was good correlation with MARS score. The higher the titer, the more severe the damage. The test which has taken celiac disease diagnosis to the commonplace is tissue transglutamase antibodies, TTG antibodies. In 1997, it was discovered that anti endomysial antibodies reacted against TTG. TTG is a 78 kilodalton protein found both intra and extracellular. Cross-linked proteins, deamides, glutes, exposes epitopes that increases binding affinity to antigen-presenting cells. So it has increased immunogenicity. Availability of recombinant human TTG made ELISA possible. It is ideally suited for screening. Though both IgA and IgG isotypes are available, IgA isotype has more sensitivity and, sp and specificity and is the ideal screening test for the presence of celiac disease. In persons who are immunodeficient with IgA, anti-deamided glidin peptide would be, uh, is the latest generation of serological test. Uh, it's available as a 
recombinant deamided glidin peptide. It is more specific than glidin, and uh, it is recommended for those who have low amount of IgA in the blood. So IgG DGP is more sensitive than IgG TTG. And this, this is uh, why glidin did not work and why um, deamided glidin peptide is the best one is that because the terminal amide uh, molecule is removed, making this more specific for glidin. Here uh, is a dramatic version of uh, what is happening. In glidin, there were uh, neutral glutamines which did not fit into the position on HLA-DQ2, while when the amide is removed, then negatively charged glutamine will fit very well into DQ2 and will then be recognized as more sensitive and specific. As you find here, that it becomes 95% diagnostic accuracy by using DGP rather than gliding. In performance of serological markers for diagnosis in 2019, they found that NTTTG had sensitivity of 96%, specificity of 91%, and diagnostic accuracy of 97.7%, and is the best method. Uh, it is equivalent to EMA, which, as I said, requires a fluorescent microscope and a trained uh, person to read so that there's a little bit of uh, subjectivity in the diagnosis. But, and if a person, but so NTTTG and EMA IgA, both IgA would be equally good. If a person has immunodeficiency of IgA, then DGP IgG would give you good accuracy. In children, it's been suggested that instead of using one antibody, a combination will give you good sensitivity and specificity. Mayo Clinic indicates that we should always consider TTG, deamided glidin IgA. This is the best combination of sensitivity and specificity. I, uh, EMA IgA gives excellent specificity, but there are analytical challenges as I've been indicating. TTG and deamided glidin IgG is most appropriate in context of IgA deficiency and HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 are useful to rule out um, celiac disease because their presence would only strengthen the diagnosis, but their absence would rule out that a person cannot have celiac disease. In 2012, um, from three biopsies to one biopsy, finally we come to no biopsy is required. If the level of IgA, TTG are elevated, which is 10 times the upper limit of normal. Patient is positive for anti-endomysial anti antibodies and patient is positive for either HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8 haplotype. What they have noticed is DQ2 is positive in celiac, is overexpressed in celiac in general population it is 30%, but celiac person will have DQ2 or DQ8. The chances of a celiac person not having either DQ2 or DQ8 is less than 1%. And so the sensitivity of the presence of, uh, of this is 100%, and the negative predictive value is also 100%. So it is used for HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8 is useful for 
ruling out celiac disease. And it needs to be done only once in a lifetime. So uh, before we go to the algorithm, we have word about how not to diagnose celiac disease, common pitfalls and errors is clinical response to gluten and gluten-free diet. A person should not avoid gluten before firmly identifying, establishing the diagnosis. And a person must be on gluten containing diet when the investigations are carried out. This condition is completely reversible, but on today, off tomorrow, for gluten hypos and gluten uh, would not be the right thing to do. So positive serum IgG or IgA anti-glidin antibodies are not indicated. Antibodies in fecal anti-glidin antibodies are not indicated. The mere presence of DQ2 or DQ8 is not indicative of celiac disease. It is required but not essential. Or flawed interpretation of biopsy histology can also give you a wrong diagnosis. ICMR had also issued guidelines on how to diagnose and manage celiac disease in 2016. They mentioned that we should go about uh, an algorithm. And they also indicated that we should also not only rely upon serology, but also do histopathology. The best is uh, the algorithm indicated by Mio's clinic. At the first sight, it looks very complicated. So let's, let me break it down into three parts. The first part is to test for selective IgA deficiency. Since selective IgA deficiency is common in celiac disease, the first thing to do is to look for total IgA. If the total IgA is normal, there will be one method of identifying. If it is deficient, there would be another method of identifying. And if it is equivocal, then we would take a third method. So the first one is when there's normal total IgA. If normal total IgA is, is present in the person, then TTG of IgA isotype is what is required. If TTG IgA is more than 10 units per ml, then this will confirm that the person is screen positive. If it is less than four units per ml, then then uh, celiac disease is unlikely. To confirm that it is unlikely, you can do HLA DQ2 and DQ8. If they are absent, you can be certain that this condition is not celiac disease. If it is equivocal, then deamided glidine peptide anti DGP of IgG could be used or EMA IgA could be used. If it is positive, then it can be confirmed by biopsy or if it is positive, then it indicates that a person is suffering from celiac disease. If IgA is detectable, but below the reference range, then TTG IgA, as well as deamided glidine peptide of IgG should be used. Of course, uh, TTG is available as Ig and IgG. Deamided glidine peptide is available as IgA and IgG, but the most effective would be to test for TTG IgA and DGP IgG. If both are positive, then we can confirm by a biopsy. If both are negative, then to add weight to the negative, then HLA DQ2 and HLA DQ8 can be tested. And if both are negative, then we are confirmed 
that this condition is not celiac disease. If on the other hand, there is undetectable total IgA, that would mean that the person has selective IgA deficiency, then we should look for test for anti-tissue transglutamase of IgA and for Ig, uh, this both should be IgG type. Test for anti-deamidate glycine peptide of IgA isotypes only because IgA is deficient, so we should do only IgG isotype. If positive, we can advise small intestinal biopsy. This is what the Mayo algorithm for investigation of celiac disease looks like. In summary, total IgA is the first test we should do because it will identify individuals with selective IgA deficiency, which is very common in persons with celiac disease. Then we should do anti-TTG and anti-deamided glidine peptide antibodies. Anti-TTG should be of IgA and anti-glidine should be of IgG or we can do anti-EMA of IgA by immunofluorescence. This will identify persons suspected of celiac disease. This can be confirmed, which is optional, by doing small biopsy intestine. Uh, we must note that specific antibodies may be absent if the person <coughs> is on gluten-free diet. So we must make sure that the person when he's tested is on regular diet rather than gluten-free diet. The only role of HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 is to confirm that if they're negative, then a person cannot be suffering from celiac disease. Additional tests which may be carried out is complete blood count, TSH, LFT, vitamins, calcium, phosphate, zinc, PTH, iron studies, and bone mineral density. The American Gastroenterology Suggest, uh, Society recommends that we should test the following symptomatic patients at high risk of celiac disease which means autoimmune hepatitis, premature onset of osteoporosis, etc. While we should consider testing for CD when the following are present, autoimmune thyroid disease, cerebral ataxia, first and second degree relatives, IBS, peripheral neuropathies, selective IgA deficiency, type A diabetes, Turner and Down syndrome. On the other hand, the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterologists, Hepatology and Nutrition have indicated that group A are children and adolescents with otherwise unexplained symptoms and signs of chronic or intermittent diarrhea, failure to thrive, weight loss, stunted growth, delayed puberty, aminoria, iron deficiency anemia, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, chronic fatigue, recurrent aphthous ulcers. They are in group one and group two will be asymptomatic children and adolescents with these conditions. They should be tested for celiac disease. They have also indicated that looking at totality, we could have a simple scoring system where symptoms, antibodies, HLA and histology are all given some points. And if after investigation, the total score is four or above, then it is celiac disease. If it is less than that, then it is not celiac disease. They caution that a gluten-free diet should be introduced only after the completion of diagnostic process and when a conclusive diagnosis has been made. 
healthcare professionals should be advised that starting patients on a gluten-free diet when celiac disease has not been excluded or confirmed may be detrimental to the patient's health. In a recent guidelines, it has European Society has indicated that total IgA and TTG IgA is superior for screening. Only if total IgA is low or undetectable are IgG-based tests are indicated. If TTG IgA is more than 10 times of, um, of the normal and families disagrees, then biopsy can be avoided, provided I EMA IgA is positive in another serum sample from the patient and they mention that it's not obligatory to do HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8. Best practices for caregivers is do the use home prepared food in which you can monitor presence of gluten, buy foods that are labeled as gluten-free, use a separate grinder or chucky for preparing flour for, uh, for, for celiac disease patients, reinforce the message of gluten-free diet to the patient periodically, educate the child's teachers about the importance of gluten-free diet for the child with celiac disease in order to avoid compulsion to eat wheat products in school, ensure that medication administered to the patient do not contain wheat flour as filler. Avoid eating outside home or in places where wheat contamination of food may be common. Do not buy food that do not have label that and may be contaminated with wheat. Do not buy flour from local mills where wheat may be grounded and can be contaminated. Finally, the key points to remember in celiac disease is celiac. C standing for consultation with the skilled dietitian. E is education about the disease. L is lifelong adherence to a gluten-free diet. I is identification and treatment of nutritional deficiencies. A is access to advocacy group. And C is continuous long-term follow-up. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That was very enlightening. And, uh, you know, from taking on the uh, origins of this particular disease to understanding whether genetic testing or serological testing is going to work, I think, uh, you know, going with what Mayo Clinic has said, you said uh, you lost the view that both. Uh, you know, both should be done simultaneously, right? Especially with the DQ2 and the DQ8. Uh... Yes, if, if we have to see the last guidance in 2020 indicates that it's not mandatory to do. But if you want to rule out, then uh, HLA DQ2 and DQ8 should be identified. If they are negative, then there are very little chances that a person is suffering from celiac disease. Because, uh, so like you said, in India, uh, the doctors from All India Institute of Medical Sciences had published a paper which you showed uh, as a pictorial map geographical representation here. You said uh, approximately 1.8% of the populace. And given yes. the fact that India is a wheat consuming, we are a gluten hungry populace, right? So 1.8% is a very large set of the population. Yes. We will go into millions. It will go into millions. I mean, a few yes. crores. I mean, two and a half to three crores. But if we look at the, uh, you know, coming from medical diagnosis point of view, as I look around and, uh, you know, I've met with uh, gastroenterologists, I met with other users who should be testing for uh, celiac. The actual awareness of celiac, the diagnosis techniques, the, the very fact that celiac is... Uh, 
a predominantly a big problem in today's uh, scenario is absent. You know, there's lack of awareness in this point. That, that is true. That's why I guess one is availability of reliable diagnostic tests along with person when to suggest. So that is why I gave you what the Americans are suggesting and the Europeans are suggesting who should be tested because, uh, because uh, celiac disease can present in the childhood or it is actually detected in when a person is 40 or 45 years of age. That would mean that he suffered through all this. And the, the good point of this disease, it is 100% it is reversible. The damage is reversible provided you make the diagnosis. But unless the diagnosis is firmly established, we should not go into gluten-free diet. So gluten-free diet shouldn't become a fad or a style statement as it has become today in many yeah. parts of the uh, It can be more damaging than good. Right. So, but uh, once somebody, you said it's totally reversible, but also when you went through the last slide of yours, which said the six points of celiac, I looked at one word which uh, hit me hard, which was lifelong adherence, right? That lifelong means it's there forever, right? Uh, th that means that predisposition is there. And if you, so that is why it is not, it cannot be a fad that today or this month you're on gluten-free diet and tomorrow, and next month when you're traveling, you say, now I can have everything. And then, then that, that can do more damage. And so uh, the best is that first we make the diagnosis and then change the diet and not the other way around. Not the other way around. Let's not, you shouldn't presume is what you're saying. Yes. Presumption is not a good idea. And how, how is celiac genetics uh, affected by the uh, state of malnutrition? You know, given that the Indian populace, in fact, is, uh, there is a lot of malnutrition in this country. I mean, is it cause or effect? See, that uh, if the villas have been damaged, if a person has celiac disease, then he, he would be malabsorption. He will have malabsorption. So, so that hmm. means that uh, two poor persons also can have, uh, have celiac disease. And if they have celiac disease, that will worsen their malabsorption. So it becomes a cascading effect going downhill then for them. Yes. For somebody in the economically weaker section, it would become a bigger problem, right? Because because, because uh, see, overall, this is an autoimmune uh, autoimmune reaction to gluten. So not everybody would react, but those who react, whether it's poor or rich, they would have the same casket. It will only, if they're poor and they cannot take nutritional uh, supplements, then it will only worsen their condition. Fair enough, fair enough. And is there a relapse time in this? Uh, when we talk about, you know, when you said something's curable, it's reversible, but you know. If they I, I, don't have a re-exposure to gluten. So right. that is why in the do's and don'ts, they have listed that uh, avoid eating out, avoid eat, um, make sure that the wheat that you eat, uh, you don't take any wheat and you make sure that it's gluten free. So. It is, uh, it is difficult to, to maintain gluten-free diet throughout life. But I think more and more, and that's why advocacy is required and support group is required because then they will be able to point you to recipes and food which could make it interesting. Yes, so, so like I you said, it's eventually, more, yeah. Uh, it's more than just a medical condition. Exactly. It need, need support from dietitian. And I guess we need to involve more dietitians into, uh, into diagnosing and decision making because they yeah. would guide them on what to take and what not to take. So it's, it's basically, it's, it's your entire, the moment you get diagnosed, your entire yeah. life, uh, I mean, it takes yes. a U-turn, right? It takes a, literally a U-turn. It and changes, but you recover because the symptoms will disappear once you are disciplined, then it may, might make life easier. Make life easier. But one is always going to be watching over the shoulder for that uh, wheat effect, the gluten yes. effect. That's true. Well, thank you very much, sir. This was, uh, like I said, very enlightening. And, you know, the way you documented it, the way you said that how 
the incidence of the disease has gone up tremendously since the 50s. You know, the US may be a, you may have used the US as a sample, you know, like a testing sample that we did this many samples in the 50s, we did this many samples in the 2000s. There has been a shift in the disease. In your opinion, is there any particular reason why you think this particular uh, increase may have happened? Is it our lifestyle? Is it something else? Could, could be the lifestyle changes. And one, of course, is one is that you suspect faster, so you test. And now you have, uh, see, if the diagnosis is only after biopsy, then the diagnosis is going to be rarely made. But if it is after doing an anti-TTG, then it's easier to do. That is there. But they did notice that if you take the pool, with uh, the sample pool which was collected in 1950, and the sample pool which you collect in 2000, the prevalence from 0.2 becomes 1%. So that means that more persons are now getting, uh, getting celiac disease than it was in the past. So I guess it will partly do with the exposure that we have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ratan. Thank uh, you. Took your time and effort and nearly went through the presentation in a very detailed manner. Even for lay people like us, we're a great learning experience. Uh, sir, on behalf of Jay Mitra, thank you again. And we'd like to present you with a small uh, certificate, right? We'll, I, I will come personally and deliver the certificate, the hard copy. But for now, we'd like to present you with a little uh, digital certificate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time and effort, sir. Thank you. Have a good day, sir. And thank you all for attending uh, as part of the Jay Mitra Educational Series. We look forward to having you over at our next Jamitra Scientific Seminar. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.